and to renew the nation and the world, all in the context of establishing the kingdom of God here on earth. It is a very important concept it, that we hear being used by a plethora of preachers and teachers, particularly evangelists, talking about kingdom building. Can we realize the presence of the kingdom of God, AKA the kingdom of heaven among us? It's amazing when we look at the four gospels, particularly the synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The word synoptic, as you know, means parallel because the content in those three gospels, those first three gospels are, are very, the content is very similar, even though chronologically that is not how they came about. In fact, uh, the four gospels were not even the first uh, books of the New Testament set into writing. It was one of Paul's letters, epistles. But when we look at the four Gospels, particularly the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and even in John's Gospel, there is this expression, the kingdom of God, whereas uh, the, the, the tax collector turned uh, apostle and evangelist Matthew speaks more than two dozen times of the kingdom of heaven. Most biblical theologians, most biblical exegetes will say to you that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are one and the same. You can use them, the kingdom of God, AKA the kingdom of heaven. So Matthew speaks about this kingdom of heaven. Luke speaks about the, this kingdom of God when asked by the scribes and the Pharisees, well, where is the kingdom? When will that kingdom come? Jesus says the kingdom of God cannot be observed. You cannot say here it is there or there it is over there for the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is among you. It's in your midst. But the reality is, is that because of the paucity of the authenticity of our proclamation, our preaching, we have failed to help, help people to connect the kingdom of God, AKA the kingdom of heaven as an ever present reality. That while we cannot fully and totally embrace the kingdom of heaven right here on earth as far as experience is total content or fulfillment, yet the kingdom of heaven is present here among us. We can have a foretaste of glory divine. Yes, we can find heaven right here on earth. And I tell my congregation, don't tell me that that is not so because you told me that you're not worried about going to hell because you're going through hell right now. Well, I guess if you're going through hell right now, can't you go through heaven right now as well, Bishop Kidwell? That we have to, we as, we as, we as preachers, we as teachers, must elevate ourselves, must, as, as we're going to hear Minister uh, Jason Moore talk about, from stagnation to elevation, that the only way that we're going to really elevate ourselves into understanding this principle of kingdom building is that, first of all, we can respond to the call to be a Christ in our contemporary world, in our present circumstance and situation. As I tell folks, Christ was not Jesus' last name. It was not his surname. It was his office. It was his position. That Christ comes from, Christ is a derivative of the Greek word Christos, which means the anointed one. And in the uh, Hebrew scriptures, in the Torah, we find the uh, Hebrew equivalent, Mashiach, Messiah, Messiah is the anointed one. In the New Testament, Christ is the anointed one. So that anyone who is functioning under the anointing, anyone who has the unction in the junction for the function, is well aware that the Christ, that Christ is a position. It is an office that each one of us must aspire to that position, to that office. We must become a Christ, not the historical Christ. There's only one historical Jesus, the Christ. But the reality is, is that God is constantly seeking anointed, appointed, and approved men and women throughout history who can rise to the occasion, who can elevate themselves out of the quagmire of complacency, indifference, and apathy that we find so much alive in the Christian church today. The Christian church today, for the most part, is moribund. It is on the IC unit of the hospital of the spiritual hospital, the, the Christian church today is in serious jeopardy because we are trying to uh, just simply 
shout, jump, spit, and sweat our way through the kingdom. That we must educate the masses. That we must set the captives free. We must stop giving our fish we must stop giving our people a fish so that they eat for a day. We must teach them how to fish so that they can eat for a lifetime. And most Christian ministers are not teaching their people how to fish. They are holding them in ecclesiastical bondage, in slavery. That they are reeling in the words of the famous African-American psychologist Naeem Akbar. So many of our people are reeling from the chains and images of psychological slavery. But it's ecclesiastical slavery. Because we as preachers will only teach them what we know. But what they need to know today is far beyond what so many of us have been propagating. What so many of us have been promulgating. What so many of us have been perpetuating. That we need to go come step. We need to step. And that's what this convocation is all about. It's, it's taking us to a higher level. It's, 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 it's mind stretching time. Mind stretching time for some folks it's going to be Miller time later on, but but this is mind stretching time You know what I mean? It's time to it's time for us to be willing to to launch out into the deep being willing to pull up our anchors and To let the boat go in a direction into the deeper waters where we will plunge ever deeper to discover the riches of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven and that is why we come here and engage in the study of the original substance of the divine principle, why we will have pastoral practices sessions in the, in the afternoon so that we can grow together, so that we are not afraid, we're not uh, intimidated by the intelligence of another preacher, we're not, we're not in any way uh, harnessed because we are confined to, the, uh, to, to our own BS, belief systems. That it's time for us to really, you know, stretch our wings to, 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 to not be afraid to venture into those deeper waters. Not, not, to be, not, not to be afraid of hearing something new, something different, something that is radical. Something that's radical. Now, now if you want to understand the word radical, you've got to go to the Latin nominative or the Latin noun radix. R-A-D-I-X. R-A-D-I-X, from which we get the word radical, means root. So someone that is radical is going to the root of the issue, to the root of the situation. We've, we've had too, too much superficial uh, treatment of the word. And, and a lot of us are just preaching what we heard some other preacher preaching, what that other preacher preacher heard him preaching, and, 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 and what other, what, you know, down the, down the line, we, a lot of us have not, have not engaged in, in exegesis. And that's why our preaching becomes, is not exegesis, but isogesis. We don't pull out of the text what is really there. We're just reading into the text what somebody else told us there. Like Paul fell, like Saul fell off of a horse. He never says he fell off of a horse. Or that the apple, that the tree, that, that the fruit was an apple. It never says an apple. I mean, you know what I mean? We just buy into it because that's what somebody else passed on to us. We have not undergone the rigors of academic study and discipline to be able to take our people to a higher level. I don't mean to preach here. I'm just trying to say what time it is. It's, it's, it's wake up time. Smell the coffee. Some of us, the coffee isn't strong enough. We have to, we have to smell the espresso. Because this is, because the main, the, the mainline Christian church as it exists today is on a collision course of destruction. It's on a, one foot on the banana peel, the other one in the grave. And I'm telling you right now, what worked 50 years ago in the Christian church is not working today. Because if that were, were the case, our churches would be filled to the brim. There, there would be no room today. You can, you can drop a scud missile in a lot of our churches and not hit anybody. Because we have gone, we've gotten ourselves into this situation where we have not been willing to, to engage in a kind of... of, 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 of A radical kind of preaching, progressive preaching and teaching that will empower our people to become the masters of their fate and the captains of their souls. With Christ Jesus as the actors, Christ Jesus as the wheel in the middle of the wheel, Christ Jesus as the author and the finisher of our faith, Christ Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the same. Yesterday, today, and for I'm not afraid of that. I'm, I can handle that. He, he's the same. Every day the same. 
But the reality is that the context in which we have to proclaim Jesus, the one who will save us from our sins, our, who will save us from our sins, the one, the way in which we proclaim the Christ, the anointed one, says that somehow we have internalized that which we seek to preach, that which we seek to pass on to others. You cannot teach what you do not know, and you cannot lead where you do not go. That's the reality of this work. And that's why we, we can go beyond denomination, beyond race, beyond culture, but beyond socioeconomic, geopolitical backgrounds so that we can understand the privilege it is to be called to be a preacher of the gospel. It's a privilege. I love it when I, hear the, when I read the words, Christ Jesus, you did not call me, no, I called you. You did not choose me, no, I chose you. And, and the reality is, is we've got to look at what God has chosen, what Christ Jesus has called into ministry. Because most of us wouldn't have come into ministry. Most of us would, couldn't even stay in the ministry if it were not for Christ Jesus. If it were, if it were not for the anointing. I know that whatever I do is under the power of the anointing. It is not I, as Paul said, but Christ Jesus living within me. Is he real? That's the question. Is he real? A lot of us are playing church. Preachers play in church. Charlatans of the word. <laughs> Pulpiteers who are parroting what someone else said, but have not discovered it for themselves. Who have not studied to show that the word of God says study to show thyself approved. We as preachers are not doing enough studying. We're not doing enough research. We're not doing enough reading. We're not engaging in, 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 in activities within our community, within our society, that will, meet, that will clearly show that we are not only a priestly people, but we are prophetic people. That we are kingly people. Our people need to know that they are sons and daughters of the king. That God don't make junk. We've got to make the word of God relevant to the young people on our streets because they're tired of hearing that old stuff that, that so many churches are, are, are feeding them like what I call Dr. Waterman giving them spiritual kibbles and bits. <laughs> giving them spiritual formulac and similac. Not giving them meat. Not giving them the spiritual meat. Our, our people are hungry for the meat. But they can't get to me because we're still on the nipple ourselves. I better stop here now. Just, yeah. The reality is Dr. Rice can tell you that the relevancy of the church today has, has to put itself within the, what the Germans call the system laban, within the life situation of the people. Otherwise, we don't, the word of God is, 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 it has no meaning, it has no significance. It's like the American author, William Faulkner, who said it's, it's, it's like a tale being told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. So much of our, our preaching and teaching in the Christian church today is sound and fury, signifying nothing, has no elasticity, it, it, has, no, it has no sting, no swing, if it ain't got that swing. It don't mean a thing. If it ain't got that swing, do wop, do wop, do wop, do wop. Ow. We gotta, we've got to give it. We've got to give it. You know, if salt becomes insipid, if it becomes flat, how can you restore its tang, its flavor? And a lot of, our, a lot of the word of God isn't seasoned today. It isn't seasoned. Nothing's worse than knowing that you've grown up on some seasoned food and then you go to somebody else's house and this food is bland. It's dry, tough, no taste. A lot of times we're not giving people a, a, a savory substance upon which they can satisfy, satisfy their voracious, their voracious avaricitis. So now we come into an age where we come into this great aggregation of clergy and we're all somebody, let me tell you. The, 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 what's so powerful about this gathering that there are so, there's so much power, there's so much authority, there's so much anointing in this place. That each one of us has distinguished ourselves in some shape or form of ministry. There's a lot of power in this place. This, thing, this place is oozing. It's like one of those 
delicious homemade. <laughs> Reverend Vivian Donaldson, Donaldson is like one of those homemade apple pies that, that your mother baked and put it in the oven, ran it in the oven, as they say down south. And, and that thing starts oozing with all of those juices and, and, and the sugary substances. And, and oh, you can't wait to, to wrap your tongue around a piece of that pie with a little a la mode on top of it. Look, oh, I know you just came from lunch. But the reality is, is that the, the word doesn't seem to be oozing with a, with a savory taste and a, and a wonderful smell. It's the same old, same old, just repackaged. And that's why we need to have this kind of a gathering so we don't have to repackage stale goods. That they can hear more than just simply, you know, uh, the Lord will make a way somehow. And God will open doors that you can't see. And when I think about his goodness and all, he, he said, you use it every now and then, but you can't use it every Sunday. It's like we know that we, we, we put it so they can jump on every line. We know we, we, we just string them together, string these cliches together and, and feel like we preach the word. We know the people need more than that. They're dealing with corporate America. They're dealing with all of the schisms of isms, racism, sexism, capitalism, classism, hedonism, atheism. We've got to give them something. So I just wanted to take this time to say this. This is a time in which we are coming together in the context of our own expertise to share that with each other and to grow and to learn of each other. I'm excited about what I can learn from the Washingtons, the, 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 the Reeds, the, 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 the uh, Rices, and the Donaldsons, and the, and the Barretts, and the, and the Casbos, and the Rosses, and the Leroys, and the Rigdies, and the Kennedys, the Joneses, the Herndons, the Darties, and especially, especially from Betty. I want to know what? I want to learn some spiritualism. I want, to, I want to learn how to commune better with the ancestors. How to commune with the spirit world. Because it is. It exists. God is spirit. And we've been communing with God for eternity. So we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. With the portfolio. What's in our portfolio? Can we, if, you know, is there enough evidence to convict us for being a Christian? If we were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict us? If you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's not mine. I heard that from somewhere along the line. The reality, the point is, is that, that a lot of us are walking around with an empty dossier, an empty portfolio. We can't represent Christ. Because we ourselves have not internalized the criteria, the conditions necessary to be God's ambassador, to be God's point man, God's point woman, to be God's mouthpiece. That's what we are. What a privilege it is. To have been called by the creator of all things, the progenitor, the, the ruler, the sustainer of all things. To have been called, to have been chosen by name to be the mouthpiece of God. I don't think we, 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 treat, we treat our calling too, cavalier, too cavalierly. Dr. Millsap, you see preachers all the time. I'm a preacher. They're more concerned about titles than they are about. They're calling. The reality is, the reality is, is that our portfolios are lacking there. That if anyone would examine our portfolio for being to present our, our credentials, if they would examine our credentials, what, what are our credentials? Credentials come from the word credo, which in Latin means creed. We believe in this stuff. We believe in our calling. We believe that we, were, we are anointed. We believe that we have power. We believe that we have authority. And that unless we release the captives, set the, the captives free, unless we empower our people, we're no, no better than the slave masters 
of years gone by who sought to rob us of our dignity, our name, our, our character. There's nothing worse than ecclesiastical slavery. That's the only thing that the slaves had to hold on to when they were stripped of their identity, their purpose and their destiny. All they had left was their faith, was their belief and trust in God. When you, when you, when you, when you manacle, when you chain, when you imprison a follower of Jesus by not allowing them to grow and expand in their own spirituality, keeping them hooked up, tied up, chained up, and tangled up to some religion so as to control them and to, to keep them harnessed, then we, then we are the worst of, of slave masters and slave owners. So this is, this is the acceptable time. Today is the, the hour of our salvation. It's the opportunity for us to do a new thing, to think in a new way, to, to hear these lectures, to hear these uh, men and women of God, these anointed men and women of God who come to share with us the vastness of their pastoral experiences, who are, their tried and proven techniques and methods of success. They've come to offer them to all of us so that we might enlarge our territory. And that when we leave this place, mm -hmm. we can truly say, surely the Lord was in this place. And so we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God, as though God himself were making his appeal through us. That's the Christ in us. So let us be, let us be open, let us be ready, and let us be, let us engage in this great work of being ambassadors for Christ. Thank you very much, Reverend Cut. My goodness, thank you, Archbishop, our co-chairman of ACLC. We also have with us today our, our co-president of ACLC, uh, Archbishop Solange Lewis, and she's going to come up and give her greetings. We um, running, uh, get, please come on up, and uh, she's at uh, Little Rock Deliverance Ministry in Brooklyn, New York, and she's the co-president of our ACLC here in, in America. Let's give her a big hand, big welcome. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you. Well, well, well. After this opening remark, amen, I'm sure that we get ready to put on some Gideon boots. Amen. Isn't God a wonderful God? I just want you to touch your neighbor and say, there is fire in this place. But I'm sure we're not going to call the fire truck. Amen. But God fire is in this place. Amen. Truly God is good. Amen. But let me just greet um, to Archbishop Kim, who in his absent, and to uh, Dr. Jenkin in their absence, and to uh, my beloved uh, Archbishop George Augustus Stalin, who had just given you such powerful word. To all distinguished ministers, Ladies, gentlemen, to all of you, I just want to bring you greetings. I am here knowing that we are out for a blessing. Amen? Amen. I bring you greetings on this, our annual convention. I feel a great burst of joy to be a part of this convocation, which indeed is great at such a great celebration because we will continue to focus as our bishop said on rebuild the family restore the nation and the community renew the nation and the world i hope that we will be engaged in an open constructive dialogue as we continue the application of the divine principle as a means of enhancing our own spiritual growth through teaching and uh, 
preaching. To restore the community, we are reminded in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16, for he are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and I will be their God and they will be my people. To renew the nation and the world, we are admonished in 1 First Chronicle 16 and verse 31. Let the heaven rejoice and let the earth be glad and let the men of the nation, the Lord reign. Reverend Moon in one of his teaching stated, my mission is a cosmic mission. My concern is for all the humanity and not only this present world, but the world thereafter. My mission penetrate to the past, the present and the future. Amen? Amen. And encompass all humanity. This day, I am sure that as you journey through this convocation, there will be joy, there will be peace, there will be love. I strongly believe that on this day, our true father is in full hope. He's in joy just to see you receiving this blessing. In conclusion, it's time for us to boldly go where no one has gone before. To explore new spirituality. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let us enjoy this journey through this convocation. We are called, we are committed, and we are compelled and to do nothing but to serve. So I beg of you, stay blessed and continue to bless through this convocation. Amen. Thank you, Madam Co-President, Archbishop Solange Lewis. Thank you very much.